This week on What to Watch, Scarlett Joe is back as Natasha Rowe. She's teaming up with Flo and stealing the show in Black Widow. We're gonna talk like grown-ups? Plus, and I alley oop, LeBron James is entering Toon World in Space Jam A New Legacy. Let's play some basketball! Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton got married? Nice, it's time for What to Watch. At last, M&M's mix all together in one bag. Hi everyone and welcome to Entertainment Weekly's What to Watch, the show where EW staff help you solve your viewing dilemmas. I'm your host Jared Hall and happily employed with me while the team around Britney Spears continues to resign, our staff writer Devin Kogan, associate editor Derek Lawrence and digital writer Sydney Buxbaum. Hi everyone, welcome. How are you? Hey. Hello. All right, fans of Disguises, Spiders, and Spies have a lot to look forward to this weekend because Marvel's Black Widow is finally opening in theaters and streaming on Disney Plus with premiere access. The standalone film, set just before Infinity War, finds Natasha Romanoff tangled in a conspiracy while reuniting with her de facto family of Russian assassins. Together, they battle a supervillain new to the MCU named Taskmaster and engage in some of the franchise's most brutal battles to date. So, Devin, even though its release was pushed over a year, does Black Widow still have enough bite to satisfy its audience? Absolutely. I Black Widow is one of those movies that I have been waiting for for mm -hmm. it feels like this has been a movie that people have been clamoring for, like for yeah. for years. I mean, she mm -hmm. uh, Scarlett Johansson has literally played this character for more than ten years, and finally, she's really getting her time in the spotlight. Um, and then, and it was delayed because of the coronavirus. So mm -hmm. I know um, I really loved it, and I'm so excited for everyone to uh, just to how to be able to go back to the theater and see a Marvel movie again. Yeah, absolutely. I am so happy that this was the first movie that I saw back in theaters because it. Mm -hmm did feel like the perfect way to, you know, kickstart real life again. Um, mm -hmm. It was so fun. It was way funnier than I expected. The movie does introduce uh, a, a loose nuclear family of spies, including David Harbour as the father figure, uh, who's kind of a, a Soviet Captain America gone to seed, and uh, Florence Pugh, who's Natasha's sort of little sister. Uh, who are your, Devin, some of your favorites in the supporting cast? I mean, Florence Pugh really steals the show. It's such a like a loving big sister, little sister relationship. Um, granted, they're also like super spies and trying to save the world. So it's it's just such a nice balance. And um, I, I'm Florence is character Yelena is one of those ones that I'm I'm really hoping we get to see more of in uh, in the MCU going forward. It felt so real, even though they're not like actually sisters. It feels like they have that dynamic so perfectly. I, I think that the teasing of each other was so great. Like you, you can't help but love and root for their sister bond. And what's one of these Marvel properties if if the, the characters aren't kind of teasing each other? That's what we all love about those. For all the great stuff there, we have to talk about the villain, this Taskmaster, which I don't know how I feel about that name for a villain. A Taskmaster sounds like someone who's really good at, at uh, you know, balancing a, a lot of things, doing a lot of stuff. But here's the point, though. The web has a lot of theories about Taskmaster's true identity. No spoilers here, but uh, Devin and Sydney, can you promise us a good payoff? We don't, it, it's a fun mystery to have where it's this, this sort of, and it's such a fun idea for a villain. The idea that this villain can sort of has, you know, the shield skills of Captain America and the archery skills of Hawkeye and, and all these different things. So it's, it's definitely something that we haven't seen in the MCU before, which is really fun. Yeah, I loved going into this not really knowing anything about who this villain was and the fact that, you know, Taskmaster can mimic any person that they're fighting it makes for some really incredible action scenes because mm. the the fighting it, it's it's a lot more brutal it's a lot more fast paced mm. it's really like they have some great hand to hand combat scenes that i think they they really play up the fact that this villain can do everything that black widow can like it's it's really incredible how they're able to to make each scene dynamic in that way 
All right, fair enough. Said, said enough without saying too much. All right, uh, we need to take a quick break, but we'll be back in a sec because time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. But first, today's fan moment is brought to you by M&M's Mix. In honor of discussing Black Widow and coming up Space Jam A New Legacy, we polled fans on Twitter to see which Marvel character they would like to see thrown into the Looney Tunes universe. The options were Groot, Loki, Scarlet Witch, and Aunt May. What do all of you think? I think I'd like to see, I mean, Groot makes the most sense, but I'm down to hear other options here. I think it depends which Aunt May. Like, if we get, like, you oh. know, Aunt May from, like, the first Spider-Man trilogy and put her with Granny, oh, man, there's okay. some, like, there's a one-on-one -on -one I'd watch right there. Makes a <laughs> whole lot of sense. All right, guys, stay tuned. We will be right back. What's up, Doc? And welcome back to What to Watch. Well, everybody get up. It's time to jam again because the long-awaited Space Jam follow-up, Space Jam A New Legacy, is out now in theaters and on HBO Max. And this time, LeBron James is the world-renowned athlete tasked with leading a team of Looney Tunes to basketball victory, fingers crossed. Derek, it's been 25 years since the original came out, and this has been years in the making. So has Space Jam A New Legacy been worth the wait? What can you tell us about the film? Yeah, Space Jam is back. Um, LeBron always seemed like the natural successor to MJ. I mean, in every way, you know, he's always been compared to Michael Jordan mm -hmm. since he was in high school. So it's only fitting that he would kind of take the Space Jam throne and obviously, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of expectations that he could be a great actor, right? We've seen flashes of it. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, everyone points to Trainwreck. So obviously, there's just a natural charisma that LeBron has. Yeah. And, you know, who doesn't love watching, uh, you know, LeBron dunk? I don't know. I mean, me, not me usually because he's uh, going against my team. But, like, you know, you, yeah. I think the expectations for LeBron in this movie were higher than maybe they should be. And I feel like people often kind of especially in hyping up LeBron here. They're like, oh man, like people like to go back and be like, uh, Michael Jordan wasn't actually like a very good actor, which is fair. But like Michael Jordan wasn't trying too hard. And I will say mm -hmm. maybe that's mm -hmm. somewhat of a problem here because LeBron knows that he probably can do this, right? And like he's been, you know, looking forward to this opportunity for a long time and waiting till he thought mm -hmm. he was ready. So he's definitely yeah. like trying. And I think he's good. Again, This, I mean, this is... It's, let's be honest, it's Space Jam. Like what, you know, he's not, you know, mm -hmm. out here, you know, trying to compete for an Oscar. Um, right. But I mean, maybe, I don't know. He is LeBron. It, it sounds like a new legacy isn't just promising, you know, a lot of uh, great partially animated basketball games, but it also has a lot of, lot of heart here built in. Yeah, totally. That was, um, I think, part of the reason this movie took so long was A, you know, it was brought to LeBron, you know, over a decade ago, but he didn't feel like he was ready to take mm -hmm. something on like this. But also, it's like finding the right take and not just doing it to do it. You know, I, back when we did our big first look cover, I talked to Ryan Coogler, who was a producer on this, and he basically was like the general idea and kind of our in was the examination of black fatherhood and how that could be mm -hmm. unique to someone like LeBron James, right? You know, and, and yeah. you, you want to just, you know, you're LeBron, you want your son to be the next LeBron. But like, mm -hmm. like, just because he's your son doesn't mean he wants to follow in your footsteps. And sometimes you kind of have to let them find their thing, their, their basketball. Got it. Yeah, well, okay. So it sounds like there's going to be uh, a lot of appeal to, to dads, maybe some guys who grew up on the original. Now they've got, uh, you know, this version. Um, so that said, do you think it, like, are younger audiences the main appeal here? Or will folks who watch the original grew up on that, um, you know, be into this one? Is it more for them? That's honestly something I've been, like, thinking a lot about and struggling with mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm sitting there watching it. And this was like the formative movie of my youth. Like I remember like just watching this on repeat. The soundtrack was the first CD I ever owned. And like, oh, I wow. probably wore that thing out. So it's like, obviously there's a nostalgia factor, right? Mm -hmm. But then, so I go in now and I'm like, oh, is this, this feels like it's mostly for kids. So I will be interested to see what different generations think. Uh, you mentioned the um, the soundtrack, that first one. It, um, it was like nothing but bangers. So can we expect the same from the soundtrack for this movie? I'm going to be honest, I, I've been a little disappointed so far with, with the music we've oh. gotten because, you know, I was out, you know, like I said, first CD I ever owned, it mm -hmm. was just this weird collection of people 
like in a perfect collection. Like we literally had Coolio, Quad City DJs, like Busta Rhymes, mm -hmm. Method Man, L L everyone. And this one, also really weird collection of people, but not one that's like really been up my alley so far. So there's like people I like separately, but it's just like the Jonas Brothers are on the Space Jam soundtrack. Like that's weird to me. Like, I don't know. That's not, you know... <laughs> Is that is that the Coolio of this generation, the Jonas Brothers? Maybe they're just maybe they're just really big fans, and they were like, "We uh -huh. really want to be on the Space Jam soundtrack." Devin, I'm a really big fan. They didn't put me on the Space Jam soundtrack, <laughs> and, and I've made music in my life. Don't go listen to Spicy Deluxe oh on MySpace, um, Derek. Derek, you're you're no no Kevin Jonas. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's a back, that's about wow. as big an insult as you can give. <laughs> but it sounds like you got Sydney and Devin's interest when you said Jonas Brothers. So does that mean you're now going to go check out the movie, or were you always planning on it? Yeah, I was always planning on it, but knowing that the Jonas Brothers have a song on the soundtrack, I am absolutely in, so can't wait to see that. <laughs> uh, well, you guys, uh, th this episode, it's um, it's been a slam dunk, I gotta say. And with that, that's all, folks. Thanks to my guests, Cindy Buxbaum, Devin Kogan, and Derek Lawrence. We'll see you next week on What to Watch.